I'm feeling mean Tonight I'm feeling mean I'm feeling mean Instead of 100 meters, we put it at 105 meters. That is going to be pushing its ballistic capabilities. Well, let's do it and see what happens. We fired 50 gram BBs at this sort of range before, and we only got one or two on the target. But this is a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> hey guys, welcome to the Gunshot with me, John, and we've got Nick Horton today with some absolutely awesome big duck guns. What have we got? I've got two, they're not a pair, but they are two uh, single barreled um, Henry Jones rotary underlever, four and a quarter inch super magnum four bores. Um, they were built by uh, Alan Myers, who is uh, a gun maker from Lancashire. I think I'm right in saying that he built about 15 or 16 of them um, and, and these are two that are separated by a number of years. You can, you can see how um, his gun making experience has kind of progressed with the, with the way that the two guns are finished. But these are um, a, a modern take on the old four bore and probably the easiest way to illustrate it is to look at this cartridge case. This is an old Ely. Uh, paper four ball cartridge. I'm not entirely sure what the load of this was. It's number three shot, I can, I can see that. Um, it's probably about three and a half ounces, I would imagine, yeah, for, I would for, for, for a sort of a relatively short chambered um, f factory load or loaded cartridge. Um, that's, that's that. And, but this is the four and a quarter brass case super magnum. Are all four and a quarters brass case again the, the four and a quarter four bore is really something of a, a of a more modern construction you can you can see that four bores originally came in a in a fairly standard um uh, long cartridge length and and in the in the sense that the variety of cases that was available was quite limited for four bore with, with eight bore for instance it went from three and a quarter up to again the four and a quarter thin brass cased super magnum for because there wasn't never quite the same um, market for them that's probably about where the development of the commercially loaded case ended the, the thing with these guns is that because they're only I think about maybe 15 years old, possibly 20 at the outside. These have taken the four bore um, on to uh, new dimensions. Four and a quarter inch case, I'm going to check the load, um, capable of firing up to four and a half ounces, which is over the quarter pound of, of, the, of the four bore nomination. Um, and you can imagine that using uh, lead in BBs. Um, or, or even larger. Oh, a um, fairly dense pattern, really. You get, a, you get a very dense pattern, and, and certainly if you went up to some of the sort of more, I say traditional, but some of the more extreme uh, shot sizes, such as um, AAA, you would still get a, a reasonable pattern with AAA shot, which would give you a, a phenomenal uh, range in yeah, terms you're of. You're talking 100 yards is actually you're, you're talking 100 yards. very capable. Exactly. Now, Th these guns, when they were when they were built, have actually been nitro-proofed. Mm -hmm. Now the cartridges that we've got today um, are all black powder because it's uh, it's not only safer but it's a lot more pleasant on your shoulder shooting um, black powder in in, yeah. in these sort of quantities th than it is nitro because of the variation now in particular in the different chemical constructions of nitro powder. It's, I, I don't know that any, anybody has any nitro loads for a, a very modern four ball like this one, which as I say was um, uh, a Birmingham nitro proofed, mm -hmm. um, in, in order to load cartridges without doing a lot of work up experimentation. So we're sticking with black powder, no, we know it, love it, know how it goes, um, and you will enjoy firing these. I genuinely really will. So when talking about these cartridges very briefly, it's a standard primer, standard shotgun primer? It, it's, it's a, looking at that, um, is that a 109? Yeah. Yeah, it's a 109 primer. Um, we, we've got a number of, j just in passing, 
um, kind of efforts on the way to uh, the previously looked at trying to keep the four ball in commission. The, these are um, uh, plastic cases made with compression formed heads. Um, my understanding is that one of the problems with these is that because there are significant dimension, dimensional differences in the, cham in the chambers of mini four bores, the plastic cases worked okay in some, but in others they tended to disintegrate because the chamber was bigger, they expanded and split. Is that just a lack of standardization across <coughs> the four bore over, over history? I, I think, I think it, it probably was, yeah. yes. Um, as, we, as we discussed uh, previously, when, particularly when we were talking about muzzle loaders, um, which was that certainly four bore muzzle loaders, nominally four, probably five, and many were six yeah. in, in, in technical terms. Th 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 these are more standard dimensions, but. If you think about it in 12 bore terms, a 12 bore should be 729, but can vary by, by 60 thou. Exactly. Uh, if, you, if you expand that exponentially yes. to one of these, it's actually, you're <laughs> talking. Well, visible differences. Me measurable differences. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. visible differences. And, and I, think that's where, I think that's where the problem arose, which is why, certainly for, for, for guns of this size, um, a, a lot of the, uh, of the owners of guns of this particular style, or indeed um, old English guns, um, are opting for brass cases. Um, one of the issues is that it does have to be sort of externally lubricated before you load it. And that's just lanolin? Uh, it, it is, uh, I believe it is. In fact, let's have a look. Have a smell. So, yeah, that's lanolin. Um, it, it's just to stop the case from sticking when it expands, which it's bound to do. Um, oh, yeah, so, so uh, primer, just a standard charge of black? Uh, y yes, I, you know, I can't remember what the exact charge is in these cartridges, but it's a, a, it's a, a um, a, a tested um, four ball load. Yeah. And it's a standard shotgun ground. Black powder, um, not anything. Again, to... I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that it might be one of the larger sizes. It might, might, even, it, it might even be hawker's grain. Oh, okay. Um, we, 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 we'll get some indication from, from the smoke and the residue up the barrel as to possibly what the grain size was. I don't think these are cannon powder. I think these aren't long enough to, for that to burn um, uh, to, to its best. Um, what? Uh, again, it's my understanding that these are conventional and commercially available um, oh, okay. four bore fibre wads. Just fibre with a card topper sort of thing. Yep, yep. Okay. Conventional in that respect um, and sealed at the top. That looks to me like a paper wad and probably sealed with bathroom sealant. Oh, really? Yeah, very popular way of sealing. Uh, really easy, I suppose. Commercially available, very easy, quite yeah. cheap and easy to use. Exactly. And, and it has sufficient stick to um, to, pr to provide the sort of the back pressure that you need, but, but without having such a grab on it that it dangerously increases the pressure. Um, and also with a quick smear over a card wad, it gives you a much improved um, degree of waterproofness Indeed. to keep the damp out. Oh, I just wonder if it's worth <coughs> just having a quick look at the, um, at the action of the gun itself. Of course. Uh, it, only because um, I, I'm... I'm old enough to have started shooting when uh, underlever hammer guns, uh, you know, conventional 12 bore underlever hammer guns was what a lot of people started shooting with. They had not yet reached the point that they have today of becoming sort of, you know, antiques almost. Oh, very much so. Um, a curiosity more than anything. Yeah. And, and a lot of us <coughs> kind of cut, cut our teeth on, a, on, a, on an action like this. Uh, it was invented in or patented in 1859 by Henry Jones, who was um, a, a worker in the Birmingham gun trade. And, and it's what's known as an inert action in the sense that we'll get close ups of how it works inside a bit later, but there are no, there's no springs inside the action. The action itself is entirely manually operated. Very pressure fit based. It, it is exactly that. And the beauty of it is, is that I've shot some rather slack old underlever guns where the lever has Actually sits has, over to the other has, side by has, quite some has significant gone degree. Well, it's gone well past the 90 yeah. degrees. It's over here somewhere, but the, but the gun is still tight. Yeah, uh, really very easy to repair. They are, oh, to be fair, probably probably wiser and stronger than a top lever with spindle. I, I think so. And, and in fact, I mean, I one of the, um, the thought that occurred to me only the other day, um, Tolly's 
uh, were still making these um, uh, Jones underlevers well into the 20th century. Um, and the design, as I say, patented in 1859, but it was one of the most popular designs with, um, certainly through the Pinfire era, which was relatively Short. relatively short-lived, but again, in, certainly into the, um, the the early years of the um, of the centre fire breech load, and this was an extremely popular action. And of course, one of the reasons f for that, I suspect, is that you don't lose during the manufacturing process. You lose relatively little metal from here, and 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 none at all from from this part of the action, which would otherwise it very strong. Co contain very yes, strong. and 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 again, you've got the lock up between that and the barrel. And regulation of a Jones underlever is significantly easier than, yes. than a standard yeah. double bite or anything yeah, else a more big, complex. Yeah, a big a big hammer probably. Yes. <laughs> so um, that that's kind of the action. Um, I think we've looked at the. Uh, some of the ballistics. I, I haven't got a, a 12 bore cleaning brush, but that's a four bore cleaning brush. Which so is the best way we can show it is to put this 12 bore here next to this cartridge here next to the brush. Obviously, the brush is oversized. Uh, the cartridge is tiny of the 12 bore. It's not really when you think about it, but yeah. No. It is a, it is a beast, and everything about it is large. Yes, I, I think, I, I, I should have put a, a tape measure to this, it's 40, 40 plus inches the barrel, wow. uh, I, I believe. Um, and again, I haven't put it on a pair of scales, but my guess would be that the weight is in excess of 20 pounds. Yeah, I put it about sort of, I was going to say 12 kilos then, but yeah. That means nothing to me. Sort of 25 pound mark. <laughs> yeah. Got to be around the 25, 26 pound mark. I, I couldn't disagree I with mean, it's, you're going to get a hernia shooting it in any quantity, aren't you? Yes, and uh, uh, again, because we, we've previously looked at a, at a muzzle-loading four-bore from a different era, th these guns are very much intended for shooting flying birds. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, a classic foreshore goose gun, which would have been uh, extremely popular in, in an area where there were lots, in particular, of grey geese. Where, where the cost of the outlay of the cartridge against the size of the bird that, that you were bagging would have, would have been about right. Um, in years gone by, four ball cartridges would have been expensive. Um, today, as you can imagine, you're into a completely different ball game in terms of, of components. I mean, I think these brass cartridges, to, to have those machined up, they're probably about 25 or 30 pound each. Yep. Although that they could be used almost indefinitely. Um, these are lead um, for use inland uh, in Scotland. Um, but if they were one of the non-toxic al alternatives like power shot or bismuth, I hate to think what the cost of the cartridge per bang would be. A lot. Yes. I mean, you're going to be in the sort of 15, 20 pound mark, aren't I, you? I think it is. You're, the trigger. Yeah, you're probably getting up into almost sort of, you know, punt gun um, cost brackets when you're talking about some of the more exotic, non-toxic shot. That's fascinating. Uh, brilliant. It's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, in terms of actual action design, both of these have a very similar locking system, uh, but the hammers are different. This one is non-rebounding and this one is rebounding. Yeah. In terms of Myers's making, you said these aren't very old at all. No, I mean, my, my understanding is that they're probably 20, you know, they, they might be less than 20, they might, they might be a bit more, but they're not, they're not old, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. No, they are very nice. And so this one says it's number 15, which means it, I'm presuming is probably one of the last ones he made. Uh, again, I believe it is. And, and when you look at it closely, you can see how, how, he's, how he's got better at it as, as he's progressed through, Indeed, the, yeah. through the numbers. And, and this one... Um, uh, being one of the later ones is, is very, very close in its appearance to um, a, a, a classic tolly. Yeah. And, and a tolly is generally, I guess, the measure that everybody will go by when looking at a full bore rotary underlevered single barrel. I, I think so, yes. Um, they, they pretty much cornered the market for them. Um, they, they, they did make other guns uh, and were well known for a whole variety of, of, of conventional uh, 12 bores in particular. But their speciality um, was uh, was big bore guns, which of course, in terms of how that related to the Birmingham gun trade, went right back to the foundries in terms of action blanks and that kind of thing, which they were commissioning 
um, and which would have been very much outside the normal parameters of your average provincial gunsmith. They are absolutely awesome, aren't they? Absolutely awesome. But they're so totally different. Absolutely different. Surprised me that he put an oval on this and then didn't put an oval on his actual fine gun there. Indeed, yes, and I've and I've just noticed that there there's a there's a swing sling swivel, swing swivel on the on end of that. One. But no, but nothing on the barrel, which is I suppose you could. I guess you would have a leather yeah. band up or not yes. something. But I, I think um, uh, th one of the main issues with a gun of this size and weight is that if it's humanly possible, you get someone else to carry it. <laughs> Never was a gun bearer more handy. No, and and I and I think there's many um, uh, a, a probationary member in a wild fowling club um, who has been lured onto the marsh with the, with the option of a shot or two you know you know one shot if you're lucky with a gun like this um, but but on the uh, on the understanding that for the three mile trek out and the three mile trek back with or without a goose or three you carry it lad yeah I'll be wary of that one <laughs> this is brilliant is they're very coarse checker I and mean, they are very still very practical guns by the look of it absolutely yes uh, and uh, there's there's no as indeed the originals, there's no frippery in it. There's there's no there's no there's nothing that does not add to to the general performance of the gun. Oh, so this one is actually quite beautiful. You've got some very nice quality engraving. Well, yeah. You've got some half decent engraving. Yes. By chance, I mean, that's, it's not completely utilitarian. No. Um, uh, and again, I'd, only because I don't know that we've touched upon it. Um, super full choke. I'm not entirely sure what that is in a four ball. Oh, I wouldn't want to guess. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I should be interested to see on, on, on a pattern plate how, how these perform. Yeah, well, I'm thinking of how far we would put a pattern plate. The answer, I say we test everything at 55 yards just purely because that's what we'd like, but I'd love to shoot at 100. Well, I, I think, I mean, we've got there's four cartridges, two guns. Um, I think probably if we start at 50 yards and, and, and move it out. Have you shot four ball at live game, I presume? I, I, I have, yes. Not, not these. Um, I've, I've, I've shot flintlocks, muzzle loaders, uh, and, and a few breech loaders in the distant past. Um, so, yes. Tell more. How is it? What happens? It's... Um, uh, what is the furthest bird you've shot with a four ball? I, I have to say that th th these are probably guns uh, that are best suited to areas of the country where you get a lot of grey geese. Um, where, where the target is big enough to justify the cut. This is not a gun for flighting teal, obviously. Um, and you imagine four and a half and ounces of six yes, shot. <laughs> yes, of course in this part of the world, in the south of England, um, the, the Brent long since protected um, and, and the, the occasional sort of great feral grey lags that you get, very unpredictable, always Canada's, but they're uh, again not something that you can rely on. And the rest of the grey geese sadly don't occur down here in, in any meaningful numbers at all. So this, this is a gun for the east coast, p points further north, um, uh, up into Scotland. I think you could put practicality aside. It would still be great fun to go out and actually just, just, well, it is. just have fun with it. Oh, it is. Even and if you went and just shot a mallard with yeah. it. It's and and that's, that's about as far as I've got. A sense of occasion. Yes, I, and I, I, I can't say that I've performed any great goose slaying um, <laughs> feats with mine, but I, I've, I've, had a, I've shot a couple of mallard with it, um, which is about the smallest target that moves, I say slow enough, that, that, is, not, is, that, that is not rocket assisted like a teal, um, which just leaves the gun behind. Um, the, and you ask what it's like, and unless you fire a lot of cartridges from one of these things, um, a, a number of things go through your mind just before you, pu you pull the trigger. One is the cost, two is the um, is is trying to do a quick mental calculation about the sight picture, you know, g given the increase in range, you know, where do I... Very different leads. It's, it's, of, it's yeah. very different. You're into a whole different ball game of leads. You know, how's the choke going to perform? Um, it, it's Actually it's, keeping the thing swinging. It, it's a bit of inspired guesswork at that point, but of course the thing is uh, that, that is uppermost on your mind is how badly is it going to hurt me? <laughs> because um, it, they, they do go off with a bit of a warmth. Um, muzzle loaders, relatively gentle. The, the, the fours that I've used in the past have, um, have used old 
uh, reloaded to the point of disintegration paper cases, but as we described before, that will only hold so much. Um, I, I've not fired one of these monsters. And sadly, I have to say that bec because of my rotator cuff and shoulder injury, there's no way that I'm going to be firing one of these today because I can barely pick it up. Uh, the last thing we'll do before perhaps actually going out and making some noise, one has a square rim and, and one has a round rim. Indeed. And the I've square rim says A Myers and the round rims do not. Yes, and I've, I've made uh, a, a specific note on this. The, 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 the black action gun, which is yep. this one, which is the earlier one, has a square cartridge rim. So if easier, we, to, easier to ream the ejector or the extractor, I suppose. I, 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 think, it's, I, I think it's a possibly a, a construction uh, issue. The, the, these, this gun has got the, the, the rounded ones, and I've been asked to make sure we don't put that, I, the wrong that one. I don't put the cartridges in the wrong gun. It makes sense. The more refined cartridge in the more refined thing. And that just goes back to the difference in tolerances between different yeah. four bores. Yes. All right, let's go out. Let's go and make some noise. At this point, we were so excited to shoot the damn guns that we actually forgot to provide any context about what we're going to do. So here you go. We put a target out of 55 yards to pattern test it. And to be honest, I was completely clueless of what to expect when I pulled the trigger, as you're about to see. I, I'm feeling mean, I'm feeling mean. Tonight I'm feeling mean, I'm feeling mean. Tonight I'm feeling me Gonna make an ugly scene Tonight I'm feeling me Close on, close off, that still takes the biscuit. And that came out nicely, yeah. Oh, beautifully. Right, I'll take that one off you. Yeah. Shall we go and inspect the pattern plate? Oh, let's do that. <laughs> well, not it? Yeah, I'm not surprised. I think I hit everything. Yeah. You probably put that just about in the centre, I think. Does it click there? If you're on the side, you I might... Say, I it was yeah, so plumbed you might, everything. The, the, Good. the centre might have been about there, do you reckon? Yeah. Ish. So as you can see on here, at 55 yards, it was um, pretty devastating. Yes, absolutely. And penetration-wise, you've fired at these targets before. Um, can you tell anything from the from the holes in it, uh, or is not it... particularly? Only from the cleanliness, really. In terms of penetration, we kind of should should get a ballistic gel out or something like that. Yeah. But we all know what ballistically a BB is capable of. 55 yards is yeah. probably fourfold of that of a number four shot or, or, yes. or a three shot so should we Cut. put it at 100 yards and Let, see what it let's let's try that i mean there's there's a bit of there's a bit of a, there's off gaps the, to, to me the the center of the pattern is a little it's bit, got a little hole hasn't it a little bit thin but i mean in, in as much as every cartridge is different then uh, with the next one i'm guaranteeing this is coming out of the air oh <laughs> that's a very very dead pheasant oh yeah yeah <laughs> oh and certainly i mean if you if you think that uh, the, the silhouette that you've got on there, if you were to add probably another six inches to each of those wings for, for a large grey lag goose. Oh, your body is sort of this. Exactly. Most of that centre behind yeah. you. It's got lots of holes in it. It's a very capable <clears throat> cartridge. Indeed. Let's put it 100 metres. Let's try that then. <laughs> okay, so we actually put the target out, instead of 100 metres, we put it at 105 metres, which is about 120 yards, something like that. Yeah. They say that that is going to be pushing its ballistic capabilities. However, I don't think it is. Well, let's do it and see what happens. All we can do, and we can always bring this to put a third target out somewhere a bit fairer. Indeed. Uh -huh.
me stick that one to you. Thank you very much. They're not very sticky and delicious. Indeed, yes. In terms of what to expect, I mean, we fired 50 gram BBs at this sort of range before, and we only got one or two on the target. Yes. But this is a whole different kettle of fish. When yeah. you're talking an extra two and a bit ounces of weight. Yes. Perhaps not as much speed. But no. I, I don't know, what sort of speed do you reckon that's kicking out? I'm thinking it's probably doing about between 1,000 and 1,200 feet per second. It's not too slow, about the same as a 50 gram BB nitro load actually. Yes. About 12. Yeah. So anyway, we're now down here, as you can see. We'll start very quickly with the target. We've got seven bulls on target. None on the bird. No. But that's something at 120 yards, that's... Yes. And j just as an illustration, in, in range terms, there's a there's a at least one BB pellet stuck into the into the fence post, and that's well stuck in there. I mean, it's virtually gone into the to the full depth of the pellet. In terms of deformation, you've got a bit of barrel wall deformation there, or choke deformation, so yes. on the wrong side. But actually, it's fared pretty well, and that's to actually stick in there is going to take some. Yes. So some I'm, grunt. Yeah, I'm thinking that. Okay, pattern that far down range, a bit iffy but in penetration terms, but certainly with a flying goose, you'd only want one of those, you know, to, to <coughs> comparing your goose with a fence post to seriously spoil its day. Indeed, indeed. I think in reality, ballistically, probably worth keeping it within the 100 yard mark, but yes. if you were hungry, you'd take the shot. Yes. And hope that it flew just there. Yeah, and, and again, not, not that we're encouraging anyone to shoot at those sort of ridiculous ranges, but it's really just to look at the ballistic parameters of the gun. I, I would say, I think it's probably safe to say, that at a, a good 80 yards, you'd be consistently killing birds. I tell you, I've got a real good way of testing. Should we shoot a backpack at 80 yards? Let's do that. Why not? Sticky one, and we'll uh, go down and have a look at our 80 yard target. All right, Nick. Well, I think we found the answer to high bird shooting. Indeed. It's a four and a quarter ounce load of probably BBs. Of, looks like a BB, doesn't it? Yes. Well, that BB, it was definitely a BB we pulled out that yeah. fence post. Yes. That is a very dead pheasant consistently. And that was just over 80 yards, 82 yards, which yeah. is perfect, really. Excellent. Well, if you're after firepower, you can't beat it, can you? No, you really can't. I, you'd happily shoot uh, maybe a dozen shots through one in a day. <laughs> All those of you that have bought your 34-inch barreled Parazzi's, eat your heart out. Yeah, 48-inch barreled A. Myers and Son from Preston. That's where you need to go for decent high bird guns. Oh, that is unbelievable. I suppose it's not, it's just basic ballistics, but it is unbelievable. Yes, I, I, I think it's uh, an, an eye-opener you know, back into a, a world of a hundred years ago, as I say, appreciating this, this is a fairly modern gun, but you can see now why they developed four bores, because there's no doubt about it, they do work. You can stretch yourself out that much further. Yeah. And as we have said plenty of times before, if you were going and it was about getting, not meat for your family, but money for the table, Yes. and something was 20 yards extra away and you couldn't hit it with a 12, why the hell wouldn't you bring yourself one of these and give it a go? Indeed. It's worth mentioning at this point that these two guns, this one being the earlier of the two, shoots very differently to that first. There's something about it, and me and I have had a quick chat about it, that neither of us can really explain of how, how less pleasant this one is to shoot than the other. The other was actually quite sweet. This one, it did feel like a proper hoof. Not that it's putting me off or anything. Quite a glutton for punishment.
been punched. Oh, I don't know it does. It rattles your brain a bit, doesn't it? We've got a headache already. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious me. They are buggers. Well, well done, David. You've just Thank gone you. over your bag limit for the day by taking 15 ducks. <laughs> and to be fair, if you'd had a semi-auto strapped in your yeah. back pocket, you could have taken that one as he flew yeah. away. And that is what a four ball will do at, what was that, about 45 yards? Yeah. Ish. Yeah. <laughs> Put so much time into them ducks. <laughs> to only to destroy them. Yeah. All in the course of science. Uh, science is all that matters. Uh, so we have in front of us the 16 wonder ducks uh, that we did in arts and crafts the other day. And we'll start and just take you through them. Angry duck. Dead. Dead. Concerned duck. Very e dead. Equally dead. Happy duck. I, I think he's, oh no, he's got one. He's got one. In, yeah, he would be having a bad day. Very bad. We have a uh, happy duck or, or a simple duck. Simple duck, dead. Equally, I'm not sure who this is, but it's... Bog e standard, happy e duck. Equally dead. Crocker duck. <laughs> dead, yeah. <laughs> well, and there's, there's headshot and there's headshot. <laughs> um, angry duck, number two, front facing, is... Very dead. Very dead. dead. Simple duck, dead. I think this 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 is a potential survivor. I can't see in this. That's. Yeah, I, don't know no, I that's think a... that's. Yeah, he's yeah, got we away. Have a, we have a survivor. Conservation. Indeed. You can keep the conservation prize. Gotta have a breeding pair. This has a shot that's gone all the way through it, where it must have fallen <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah. Dead. <laughs> think I duck. Deed. Very dead. Uh, teenage mutant ninja duck. L likewise. Dead. Bit of a pintail in that one. Well, this was this the thing, is it? With yes. The pintail hanging out with the mallards. Indeed. Loved up duck. <laughs> yep. Dead. His love is dead. Uh, as silly as the test might have been, actually, it's fascinating. From when we were talking about bank guns the other week mm. uh, to now, of actually me thinking, oh, you'd kill a couple if you'd had a really tight packed group of duck. Yeah. Oh, you, you'd have shot 30 or 40. Mm. There's 15 dead like that. Yeah. Unbelievable. Oh, yes. All right. We pack up and go back and try and get these smiles off our faces and talk some sense. Indeed. So that was an awful lot of fun. Uh, we would have Dave stood here, but he's currently sat downstairs with a headache uh, and acute nausea. I think he's literally suffering from mild concussion. Right, look, looking, looking, <gasps> oh, brilliant. Look, looking at the, the slow motion as to how it affected his body, it was pretty much the equivalent of being involved in a 30 mile an hour car crash. I think that's, that's a fair one to say. I mean, looking back, I mean, I was totally unprepared for my first one. I think my feet were very close together, just used to shooting a 12 ball. Uh, it's, it's a feeling that you can't really describe shooting a gun like that, apart from that it does become part of your body for a very <laughs> brief period of time. <laughs> that is um, brilliant, really. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It's been a real honour. I should say that about three times in this video because it, it really has been such an honour to shoot a gun like that when it's just not a common thing you find now. Well, as I've said before, the pleasure is all mine. As much as anything else, because this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to bring pieces of wildfowl equipment, wildfowling equipment, to a to, to a greater public than than would normally be possible. We've got a whole one or two generations of, of wildfowlers used to using nothing but modern semi-automatics mm -hmm. and although they're aware of fours and eights the, the number of people who've ever actually seen a four ball in the flesh or seen one fired for real to, to say that you could count it on the fingers of one hand would be a slight exaggeration but the vast majority of people who see this this will be something that they've never seen before and I'd, I'd love to share I've loved sharing it with you and if you could ever get behind one it is life-changing isn't it oh, it it's, is yes it's good. I say the only next step, as you have done, is to is to actually go out shooting with one in pursuit of game. Yeah. It's uh, just wow, wow. Now, 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 at least when the missus sees this, she'll know what you want for Christmas. Yeah. On which note, what sort of money do they go for? We're talking these two were about fifteen thousand apiece, valued wise. I, I'm. I think I've got this right. They were roughly six grand. Um, purchased when new, but that might be 20 odd years, might, it might be a few more years than that. But because none have been made since, and because they are a step forward in the development of the ballistic 
um, capability of the four bore over and above the old Tolly stuff, for instance, um, they'd probably retail, uh, or I say retail, you'd probably uh, be looking to pay somewhere in the region of £15,000 each. Wow. Well, you say wow, I say wow, it's not, it's not really wow, is it? I think that if you were paying less than that, you might worry. <laughs> in, indeed, yes. <laughs> Given the amount of pressure that's coming through that. Yes. I do like that. And it's all a bit personal when it's so close <laughs> to your face. Indeed, indeed. Relying on that Jones underlever, as much as we say it's really strong, <laughs> yeah. You really want like a rising third bite or, or a third bite uh, or a doll's headlock or something. Yeah, I, I, th <laughs> I think, I mean, just again, very quickly looking back at the history of, uh, of wild fowling, um, I can't think of a single occasion when I've ever known, looking back through the history books, of, um, of a Jones underlever ever giving way ever having any sort of catastrophic failure other than perhaps a barrel popping where it's been plugged in the mud but otherwise that action is incredibly strong. Well, it does fill me with a bit of a bit of faith, it does fill me with a little bit of faith. Other brands are available but you were saying so Tolly is obviously the one to go for if you want to buy something with a bit of history behind it. Almost all of the, of the big bore guns um, uh, of, of a certain design characteristic, which is very often the Jones rotary underlever. Um, they, they did indeed make th um, they made hammerless top lever um, eight and four bores, um, but Tolly was the go-to manufacturer. And certainly, if you find uh, a big bore gun, when we spoke about this previously, we mentioned Newnham's in Portsmouth. Yeah. I've seen quite a few large bore guns with the name of Newnham on them, but you've only got to look at the guns, you've only got to look at the, uh, at the sequences of the numbers on the guns to know that they were made by Tollies and Newnham simply put his name on them. And that happened all around. It was very common though, hugely absolutely, common. Absolutely, yeah, all around yeah. the country. <laughs> it's about as much fun with a gun, apart from a punt gun, it's about as much fun as you can have with a shoulder gun with all your clothes on. Yeah, well, uh, to be fair, I'd have happily done that with my clothes off and, and still had as much fun, so. <laughs> Although I think it might have been a bit graphic in 180 <laughs> frames per second. <laughs> Shall we leave it there? I, I, oh, on that wonderful thought, guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much for that opportunity. It really, really was an honour to have a go. And um, I'm sure you'll see us soon. Thank you.